I'm the, the co-founder of uh, Execution Labs, which is an early stage investor, uh, specifically in game studios, game studios making games, which uh, m makes us a rather uh, rare animal in that uh, most developers seeking funding usually have a pretty hard time finding uh, VCs or, or investors that are keen in investing in game studios. We've been around almost four years now. We've done uh, about 25 uh, deals uh, into game studios. Uh, we're, we're early stage, which means it's uh, pre-revenue, so we're um, you know, quite uh, uh, risky in our, in our choices, but we're really uh, backing teams that have uh, you know, long-term uh, growth potential. Uh, and, and our role is really to work with those teams to help them succeed and grow. Uh, and it's been an interesting process because in order to pick those 25 teams, you know, we probably have seen oh, hundreds, hundreds of pitches uh, from developers. And what that does is it, it makes you really good at saying no. You start to see the patterns and, and the red flags uh, and the kind of the telltale signs that really indicate that this is a team not to invest in. Um, do we always get it right? You know, I, we probably make a mistake here or there, but uh, again, after seeing all of those pitches, you really start to hone in on, on you know, how to say no. So th this uh, quick presentation is just some um, sort of tips, I guess, or, or, or red flags to watch out for as you're building your pitches, as you're uh, presenting to, uh, to investors. So it's kind of our, our uh, top 10. The first one is to realize you suck at pitching. Most developers on the planet are horrendous at pitching. They're just, I don't know, too, too stuck in the details of their own game. Uh, they don't empathize with the challenges or the issues of the investor and, and understand what they're looking for. Uh, they don't take the time to practice. Uh, they think they can just wing it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Suck at pitching. So, so first step at not sucking at pitching is realizing you suck at pitching and to work on it. And just, I, 1.5, you really, really suck. So I mean, I, I can't emphasize this enough. All right, so first major one that we see from most developers is they are pitching problems as opposed to opportunities. So a typical pitch will receive, you know, a cool developer working on something interesting. They come to us and it's like, we've got this amazing game. You know, I have a team uh, that, that's working on it. Uh, we're bootstrapping, we're running out of money. The, uh, you know, it's taking longer than we expected. We still need four more months of polish. We haven't budgeted anything for, for marketing, so we don't know what to do there. Um, you know, we're having trouble keeping the team on board because money's running out. Are you interested? <laughs> I, am I interested in what? And so they, they, you know, they're problem solvers. Developers are problem solvers. They have this, I don't have cash problem, and they hear that we have some cash, and so they come to us with their problem, and are we interested to help them with this problem? Um, and, and the answer usually is no, uh, you know, because we don't want to dive into that disaster, even if possibly the game is an interesting game or the team is an interesting team. And so it's largely a mindset issue or, or framing issue where they're not coming to us with this opportunity to participate in this amazing game with an awesome team that has all this potential, um, and, they're, and they're not presenting it in that way. They're presenting it as this problem they have of not having cash. So, so when you're doing your pitch, really think about what is the opportunity you're presenting versus this, you know, the problems that, that you have. All right, number three. Developers have a really hard time articulating what it is they're actually doing. And certainly, the earlier you are in your project, the harder this becomes. And it's one of the hardest things for developers to do, to like, you know, be able to synthesize what their game or project is about, what's special about it, what's special about them. I mean, I was at, I was at Gamescom, and a developer was there. So I, I'd like to tell you about my game. And I was on my way to a meeting. I'm like, great, you've got you know, 30 seconds. He's like, oh, no, I need 15 minutes. I was like, well, I, I, sorry, I don't have time. T tell me in like two lines, what's, your, what's the high level? Uh, no, I need 15 minutes. And, and you know, then later on I found out what his game was about and it could have easily been explained in one line. But you know, he just wasn't good at articulating what it was that was special or, or even just what, what it was that he was working on. Um, so you really do have to be sort of good at articulating or synthesizing what is core about your project. And that means you have to actually understand what your project is about. A lot of developers, and certainly within the, the team members, there's conflict. And we see that in those pitch meetings, 
where one developer on the team is explaining what it's about, and then we see another developer is kind of uneasy about what he's explaining. He said, well, you know, what, you know, is there a disagreement here? And then, and then the co-founders start arguing what the game is about because they haven't really figured out what, what it's about. So this, this comes through in, in, the, in the picture. So really, you know, think about what it is you're, you're doing. All right, another big one we often see is confusion or lack of clarity on whether you're pitching your product, meaning the game, for project funding or project financing, or whether you're pitching your company for a company equity investment. And how you pitch and who you pitch to, the way the deals are done, what the investors care about, changes dramatically whether or not you're seeking project funding or product financing or company financing. And rather, what we see is developers who just say, I need money. I got bills to pay. I'm going to go talk to people who have money. And they're not thinking about, OK, VCs are looking for a very particular kind of investment, and the deals are done in a certain way. Publishers are looking for particular kinds of projects to invest in and, and how those deals are structured. And so again, don't come to investors, whether it's publishers or whoever, with your problem of needing money. Really think about, you know, what is it that I'm pitching? Do I need, do I need equity investors? Do I need partners in the long-term growth of my company? Or do I just have this cool project and I need some money to get that project uh, funded? So, you know, understand yourself what it is you actually want the funding for and what you're pitching for. All right, another one we often see, certainly in the earlier stages, is full of passion, but no sacrifice or commitment. Right? This is often the case uh, in areas where there's a lot of large studios, and so developers have good, call it day jobs at, I don't know, Electronic Arts or King or Ubisoft or whatever, and they've got all this passion for their own ideas, and they come to us and say, as soon as you give us $5 million, we'll quit our jobs and then we'll be fully committed. Uh, but meanwhile, we're just sort of noodling on this on the side, you know, uh, on the weekends. Um, and while that, you know, may be a fine choice for you as an individual and sort of the, the risks you need to balance in terms of your, you know, whatever uh, personal liabilities and such, but as an investor, all that passion is, is the starting point, right? Everybody else is as passionate, and so passion doesn't differentiate you from any other startup or company that, that wants funding, and no amount of, we're really, really passionate, like it doesn't make a difference. So investors tend to be looking for some amount of sacrifice, uh, you know, or, or, or real commitment that you quit your jobs, you, you know, put everything at risk, uh, you put all your savings into this, you know, new company, whatever that may look like, but you can't just come to the table with the passion but no, no sort of sacrifice or commitment that goes behind that, that passion. Because we're, we're not, we're not going to commit before you're, you're committed. And that's pretty true of most uh, investors. This kind of uh, maybe is an encapsulation of some of the other points. Uh, but developers tend to have a very internal focus as opposed to an external one. And, and there's, no, there's no insight. So developers will often come and say, well, here's my project, and here's the, all the, the weapons, and all the levels, and all the monsters, and all the combo moves, and all the, you know, the platforms, and the technologies we're using. It's all, it's all about the project and the thing they're working on. At no point do they say, well, here's the project and how it fits into the marketplace. Here's a competitive analysis of, of who we're going to be up against in the same time frame. Here's how similar games have done last year, so we have a sense of comparison, uh, you know, of how, how our game might perform in, in the marketplace. Uh, you know, here are some of the technology vendors that care about some of the features we have, so we think we can find some, some uh, you know, love uh, uh, or, or deals that we can do with these partners to, to increase the profile of our game. You know, he, here are the festivals that we think our game is suited for and we can get more, more press and attention. Um, it's rare to find a developer who has that kind of external uh, uh, perspective in addition to really caring about this nugget of awesome that they're developing and all the combo moves and weapons and, and things that are inherent ab about the game. Um, and, and also this sort of speaks to the lack of articulation where they, they're so kind of you know, in all the details that they can't really uh, you know, say at a high level what the game is about. All right. Right team composition. Again, this one might be a little more critical uh, earlier in the phase of, uh, of starting the company, uh, but we tend to require that the co-founding team has a technical lead, a creative lead, and a business lead. And a creative and technical tends to be pretty easy for startups. Someone taking on the business role is more rare, 
Uh, that doesn't mean you have to hire an MBA who's your CEO. It just means that someone on the team has to take on that responsibility and maybe has a bit of affinity towards those businessy kind of things and doesn't freak out if they have to work on budgets uh, in a spreadsheet or, or talk to you know the bank or, or, or lawyers and such. Um, and so you know having that that balanced uh, uh, co-founding team is critical. We made some early investments where, as an example, the 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 leadership of the team were. Uh, a designer and an artist. And there was no one technical on the leadership. There were, there were programmers on the team, of course, but not at the leadership level, not at the co-founding level. And so this artist and designer, they were brilliant. They were, they were super creative. So they'd have all these big dreams and visions and amazing stuff they wanted to do. And they would say, okay, programmer, go do it. And the programmer would say, well, hey, bosses, this is, you know, this is crazy. I can't do that, or I can't do it alone, or I can't do it in the time frame you want. And they would say, shut up and stop being lazy. Just do what we told you. How hard can it be? And so because there was no one technical at that leadership level who can stand up to the creative people and say, well, hold on a second, my co-founders, you know, here's why we can't do that and we have to balance it versus our budget and timeline. You know, they, they just kind of got derailed because these creative geniuses ran off and were trying to lead the company and no one there was to kind of mitigate. And, that, and that's true. I mean, I'm giving you an example where it's the technical uh, leadership was lacking, but that kind of stuff uh, happens uh, all the time. So, so investors are looking at that. Investors are looking at who's on the team, who's leading, you know, what their background is, what's the complementarity of the skill sets, you know, where are the gaps, because certainly not just in making games, but in making a business, in building a company, it's critical. It's critical to have those kinds of different roles represented uh, in, the, in the leadership. All right, next one is uh, no roadmap or long-term vision. This sort of speaks to some of the other issues where you're so focused on the one game that you're not really thinking longer term or you don't have a larger vision of what kind of games you want to build over time or what kind of company you want to build. And so one of the trick questions that we have when we're interviewing teams is we ask them, what does your third game look like? And if they can't answer what their third game looks like, or you know, what, what, it, what it is, then we know that they're too short-term oriented and or they're just thinking about this single project. So we want someone to say, oh, well, our first game is this, but it's our first one, so it's relatively small in scope. But then we're building the design techniques and some of the technology that allows us to build the second game, which is this. And then our third game is going to take all that stuff we built, the tools and technology and the know-how, and we're going to do our third game, which is really the ambitious one, and we hope to achieve uh, you know, this, this, and this. And that, that's sort of our three-game you know, ro roadmap. Uh, and it's rare to see that, and we get really excited when someone answers that question that kind of way. As an investor, again, we invest in the company, we want to see that kind of longer-term efficiency in your game creation process. So if you're saying, well, my first game is, I don't know, a VR racing game on gear, and then my next game is going to be, I don't know, ninja fighting game on Xbox, and then my third game is going to be, I don't know, a match three on iOS. Like, it's so random that, that the know-how, the, the learnings you get of success or failure, the tools and t technology you use are going to be completely different. And so essentially, what I, what I see when that kind of random question is, you're essentially resetting each, at each project as opposed to building momentum. So part of the idea of having a roadmap in this longer term vision is that you're building momentum uh, and, and optimizing uh, over time. All right, ninth is no traction. Now this one's a bit of a sort of chicken and egg and sometimes is unfair to the developers, but you know, a lot of investors are not particularly um, kind of creative. And so if you come to them with an innovative uh, idea, it's hard for them to see, okay, is this gonna work? Is this actually gonna you know, uh, succeed? And so the more traction, more social proof, the more you know, uh, uh, success you have if you do your soft launch or win festival awards, anything that someone else external to you says this is cool or this is doing well is the traction then that you need that the investors, oh, well, geez, if you won that award and you, you got this many downloads in Australia, well, then you must be onto something successful. So assume that many of the investors don't have that creativity or can't make the same kind of leaps mentally that you can, and so you have to demonstrate, you know, what investors like to call, call traction. 
Um, and, and it's a bit unfair, right? Because in order to get traction, you need team members, you have to build your demo, you have to go to a festival, you have to do a soft launch, you know, so, that, so you do have to progress on your, uh, you know, on your roadmap, and this is, you know, part of the commitment and sacrifice side. Like, you have to do something in order to get someone else to, to, to invest. So, again, investors are looking and keying on what elements of traction can you demonstrate, what that is really depends on the kind of game you're building, what platform you're on. So traction for a single player narrative, kind of art, artful game is gonna be very different than traction for a large scale, casual, mobile game that you know, has to soft launch stuff. But just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, and the last one we see quite often is there's no clear ask, right? Normally when you're giving a pitch, if you're in front of investors or publishers, um, at the end, you should be making it very clear what it is you're after. How much money do you need? What kind of partners are you looking for? What role do you expect the publisher or the investor to take on? Uh, usually the answer is more than just the money. And of course, everyone wants the funding, but it should be more than just a check. Um, and so being very clear about what it is you need is important. And so we see, I mean, almost 99% of presentations don't have a clear ask. It be a budget, you know, there, uh, there might be a timeline, but uh, there's, there's not this clear request. It should be, a, you know, a slide or a page of itself, the ask, you know, what we need, and it should be very clear what it is that you're, you're asking. All right, so if you pay attention to all of those kind of gotchas or red flags or things that we're keying on, you know, then hopefully the money will rain on you. Good luck. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for questions for Jason. All right, I'm, and I'm happy to sort of address anything in particular, uh, you know, that I touched here, or sort of more broadly about funding or. Is there a hand? How big is the role? Uh, first of all, great presentation. Um, how big is the role of those things compared to you needing to actually like the game and think it's a good idea? Yeah. So obviously, there's, um, you know, there's a threshold of awesome. Right, the, the game has to be, or the project has to be awesome to a certain extent. Now, the, you know, awesome is very subjective. You know, awesome to a VC may be different than awesome to a publisher. You know, different investors are keying on different things, and that's part about having that external focus and sort of empathizing with the investor and understanding when I talk to publishers, these are the things they care about and what they might think is awesome versus, you know, what, what a VC or, or whatever might think is awesome. So. Um, you know, if your game is crap, no amount of these things will, you know, convince me to give you the money. Um, and depending who you're talking to, it's, it's also the team, right? So as, as, a, as a VC style investor, I'm much more looking at the team and you as individuals and you collectively and what you can achieve over the long term. And the game you have right now is just one sort of step on that journey. Obviously, a publisher is usually a different perspective because they're focused on the project. Obviously, they care about the team's ability to execute, but they're really thinking, can I make money on that project? If I invest and put my name on it, can I you know, quadruple, whatever, 10x my money, et cetera? Um, but yeah, so I, I would say the easy answer is there is a threshold of awesome and, and no amount of being a good salesperson and being a, a slick presenter is, is gonna get past you know, the fact that your game sucks. So yeah, that's the starting point. <laughs> yeah. All right, yes. Hi there, thank you, Jason. Thank you. When a startup company only has one product and it's not even done, do you have any recommendations for how to pitch this company that is almost inseparable from the product that they're trying to get out the door? Yeah, I mean, that, that's fairly common for a brand new startup, uh, you know, where, where the product and the company are one and the same. Um, so th this comes down to a few things. One is uh, the track record of the individuals. So since the company is brand new, then it's usually, well, you know, myself and my co-founder, we work here, here, and here, and we ship this, that, and this game. And you know, so you you're building yourselves as, as credible people that can get stuff done and have had some success as individuals, um, you know, even if the company hasn't done anything just yet. Uh, and then it also comes down to the vision and roadmap, right, where you say, well, we just started, Here's how awesome and the cool things we did before. This is the vision for the company we're building now. Game one is the first step on that roadmap. 
here's what the roadmap looks like and what our long-term plan is, and you know, we want you to be part of that journey and help us sort of achieve that long-term vision. And so, so then it comes back to his question of like, okay, that game, the prototype you have, has to be awesome. And then we'll say, okay, well, what, what they got now is pretty awesome. We like the story they're saying in terms of this longer-term vision, and they've sort of proven themselves as individuals in their past lives. All right, this is looking good, and, and you know, then we'll, then we'll dig, dig deeper. Yeah, so history and, and sort of future vision. Yeah. All right, we have time for one more. Any takers? Uh, how much to invest? And how much for, do we? Yeah. Yeah, so Execution Labs is a seed stage, so we're usually under half a million. So on the, on the smaller side. Thank you.